Thank you very much, uh, respected chairpersons, for the kind introduction. Uh, warm good evening to everyone, and uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. And uh, after a vivid uh, understanding uh, with uh, context setting lectures by the stalwart speakers who spoke before me, it makes my job a little easier. And I'm going to focus about the newer treatments which may be there, uh, you know, in the basket in the future, and about some of the, you know, phase two, phase three trials which are going on and some exciting molecules which are being worked upon. So no, nothing to disclose from my side and uh, this is gonna be the overview of my talk. The first three sections have already been covered so I'll kind of rush you through it quickly because it kind of holds a link to what I'm gonna talk about, the epidemiology, the pathophysiology in, 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 in brief and the diagnosis of uh, NFLD has been discussed in details by Dr. Kanwar. And also we're gonna quickly look at the guideline recommendations and then what I'm gonna talk about is the newer therapy and conclude. Now we need to quickly discriminate between the non-alcoholic fatty liver and the non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So basically fatty liver means simple steatosis but absent inflammation or hepatocyte ballooning while NASH is steatosis with inflammation and hepatocyte ballooning. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about the epidemiology. Dr. Rakesh Iser just said there's a prevalence of 40% in our country. And uh, it also keeps on increasing with the age. And uh, there is a vicious cycle between the age group and the sex in the incidences of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We have already heard in details about how we can diagnose using ultrasound, the FIB scoring, and of course, uh, uh, using the, uh, the liver elastography, that is fibroscan. I'm going to start from here, and this is how uh, you know the spectrum of the NFLD looks like. You have non-alcoholic fatty liver and non-alcoholic uh, uh, steatohepatitis, which goes in a bi-directional way, and that, of course, if goes into fibrosis, uh, leads to compensated cirrhosis, and when that worsens, leads to decompensated cirrhosis. But there are a lot of factors which are associated with this entire spectrum of NFLD. We have comorbid conditions like type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, obesity, hypertension uh, and hypopituitarism which are associated and various genetic factors are also associated. Why this is important is because there is a multiple hit hypothesis which leads to the progression and the development of NFLD in patients with these comorbidities. So there are multiple pathways and interactions between the different organs and that affect the pathogenesis of the non-alcoholic fatty, uh, fatty liver disease. And because of this multiple uh, you know, hit pathway, it gives an option of uh, targeting the disease through the various organs in multiple ways. And that's where the, uh, the evolution of the newer drugs are focusing on. So while you see here that the main context of uh, uh, NASH or non-alcoholic fatty liver in the molecular level will involve the mitochondrial dysfunction, release of the reactive oxygen species, uh, uh, leading to inflammation and the various uh, you know, chemokines like the TNF-alpha and the interleukin-6. At the same time, there are various liposaccharides and other uh, links to the gut, to the intestines, and thereby gut microbiota also plays a significant role because the, the intestinal barrier goes away and that also leads to progression of uh, NFLD. So this is a schematic summary of the pathogenesis and the interorgan crosstalk. We can call this like an interorgan cross-linking in the, in the pathogenesis of NASH. There is increased lipid synthesis and uptake in the liver exceeds the lipid oxidation and excretion leading to lipid accumulation and hence there is lipotoxicity, inflammatory response, cell death and even it finally re uh, leads to fibrosis. And at the same time, we know that the gut microbiota at the same time plays a very important role because it regulates the inflammatory response and the hepatic lipid accumulation through the metabolism of the bile acids. And innate immune system responses involved in the uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver on NASH includes also activation of those resident Kupfer cells and the recruitment of the leukocytes. 
So the risk factors I've already discussed and I've already highlighted includes obesity. And most importantly, we now know that visceral adiposity plays a very important role in, in uh, the incidences and the progression of NASH to uh, you know, fibrosis. And also that leads to insulin resistance, increase in the free fatty acid, and there is also some genetic factors that takes place. On the other hand, there is the lipotoxic lipids and there is an increase in gut permeability that loses the intestinal barrier, a lot of cytokine release and increase in oxidative st uh, stress that gives rise to the non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So this vicious cycle goes on and this complex metabolic pathway uh, takes place continuously. So that kind of opens up an arena that there can be target molecules to target these specific target organs or these specific pathways. Uh, this is a proposed investigation management for algorithm. This has already been discussed, so I'm not going to take you through it. Uh, but again, Fibroscan plays a very important role in helping us diagnosis and the basic standard of investigation remains ultrasound for the basic screening. This is something that I would want to focus upon, uh, the therapeutic strategies in the non-alcoholic steatohepatitis management. We just heard about saroglitazar, we're gonna talk about that as well. But this is the spectrum that the molecule must cover. Once, at one point, it should have a high efficacy. It should have an anti-steatotic effect. So as a result, weight loss plays an important factor here. So it will definitely start with lifestyle modification and the diet. And also there has to be a uh, reduction in the atherogenic pathway, so lipid metabolism has to improve. Going along the way to prevent the progression, there has to, the medication also has to have an anti-inflammation and an anti-fibrotic action. And thereby it would also have cardiovascular risk reduction and improvement in insulin sensitivity. At the end, the drug must be well tolerated as well as it must be equally efficacious. So it looks like this is kind of a dream molecule that would probably be there. Now this is the ACE guideline about the management of uh, NFALD and uh, it's kind of similar to what has already been discussed. Uh, you stratify the, uh, the fibrosis risk scoring stratification, stratifies it as low risk, intermediate risk and as high risk. And based on the FIB4 scoring, uh, the, the, uh, the, the patient can be guided upon uh, the, uh, the follow-up and the management. While the low risks can be taken care of by the metabolic physicians, but those individuals having intermediate risks and high risks who would have a uh, higher possibility of progression into fibrosis would probably be requiring a referral to a hepatologist. Now, we have already spoken about uh, uh, two or three molecules. One is the vitamin E, which is currently in use into our practice as well. Now, there is this PIVN study, which recommends the use of 800 uh, 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 dose of uh, vitamin D uh, uh, per day in divided doses. It does lead to decrease in the, uh, the ALT level, but there is studies and there's one school of thought that says that it does have an impact on the hepatic steatosis, but not much impact on the hepatic the, on the fibrosis. So as, as at the same time, it, can, it, it has no impact on patients with diabetes as well. Uh, there is pioglitazone. Pioglitazone, again, in the, uh, in the PIVENS trial, recommends uh, 30 milligram per day as the dosing. Uh, it does improve insulin resistance, we know, and it also improves the hepatic steatosis and lobular inflammation. But again, no effect on fibrosis. And we also know the side effects of pioglitazone that comes in terms of osteoporosis and increased risk of fluid retention in our patients. Saroglitazar has already been discussed by Dr. Sahai in the previous lecture. Uh, there is the evidences trial and that looks, looks at the four milligram per, uh, per day dosing, which definitely has an improvement in the insulin resistance and also on decreasing in the triglyceride with improved lipoprotein particle composition and size and reduced lipotoxic lipid species. It also has an uh, effect on decreasing the hepatic steostosis. And at the same time, it has, not, it has got no effect on the body weight. So these are the three drugs. Now we know that the vitamin E is widely available. It's, it's a low cost. It's recommended by various uh, international society, but there is a risk of prostate cancer and hemorrhagic stroke, which has already been discussed, uh, which can also be a limitation for vitamin E. 
Pioglitazone, as I just said, is recommended by the various international society in biopsy-proven NASH. So that's that's one 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 thought line and can be used in patients with or without diabetes mellitus. Uh, the there is no database which has which shows that there is an effect significant effect on fibrosis and the adverse effects we know. Saroglitazar at the same time has got a debatable effect on the fibrosis, but the cost of the drug needs to be considered and it's available in India. So now what are the newer molecules, you know, uh, which is there in store for us? We've spoken about pioglitazone, we've spoken about uh, vitamin E, uh, and then comes a beta cholic acid, and I'm sure this has uh, been widely propagated, you know, by our industry partners into the uh, into as one of a prospective molecule which might be uh, uh, helpful in reducing the steatosis. Now, beta cholic acid is basically an FXR agonist, uh, so it's a farsenoid X receptor agonist, which basically is supposed to improve hepatic insulin sensitivity and decrease the gluconeogenesis. So uh, it is supposedly to have impact on the reduction in the, uh, the hepatic inflammation and hepatic lipogenolysis, and it might have an impact on improving fibrosis, but it is not currently recommended to specifically treat non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. There are two limitations that we must remember because it's a natural uh, bile synthetic derivative, so it, it does have an impact on the increasing the LDL cholesterol, and also it comes with side effects like pruritus. So as a result, uh, you know, researches are going on uh, into the other types of FXR agonist, uh, like you know, elafibrinor is there one is one of the molecule you know which is which is being under uh, uh, under evaluation and in phase one or two trial, and that is one molecule uh, uh, which kind of doesn't come with the side effects of abetocholic acid. Now there are also some of our uh, anti-diabetic drugs like the GLP-1 agonists, for example, uh, which inhibits the glucagon secretion, decreases the hepatic glucose production, delays gastric emptying, and promotes satiety. And it doesn't Im impact on the weight loss. So it will definitely also have an impact on the inflammation and the steatosis part, and might have an impact on the fibrosis as well. But of course, the side effects we know are GI upset and also results uh, from further trials are also awaited. The SGLT inhibitors, uh, particularly I would say empagliflozine has shown some positive, uh, you know, uh, response, uh, uh, you know, in improving the ALT levels. We know about the pleiotrophic benefits of the SGLT in inhibitors and uh, also some, uh, some studies have shown improvement in the fatty liver index, but neither of them are, uh, are currently recommended specifically for the uh, treatment of NFLD yet. So, you know, why these molecules are being evaluated are, are because of this complex, complex drug uh, diagram. You, you see here that the glucose and the lipid metabolisms and the targeting drugs which are used for NASH. So here you can see that all these drugs play a very important path, uh, you know, important role in the metabolic pathway of the development of NASH. As a result, whether it be in the PPR signaling in the bile acid metabolism uh, or in the FXR agonism, these drugs play some role and might have a role in, in reduction of steato, steatohepatitis, uh, you know, if, if, if the, the trials come out successful. Again, some of the, uh, the um, anti-diabetic drugs which are already being evaluated. Now, we know about pioglitazone. Um, Elafibrinor, I have already discussed about. Saroglitazone is, is also being, uh, has been discussed in details. Some of the other uh, PPR alpha agonists like, you know, uh, Pemafibrate and Phenofibrate, which are somewhere in the phase two trial, might also prove to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, effective in some place. And then is the pan-PPR agonist, that is uh, lanfibrinor, that's, that's a pan-PPR agonist, which in the trial, which is in the phase three and phase two B trial, and it's found to have an impact in the liver fibrosis, hepatic steatosis, and also reduction in the ALT level, and along with in, uh, reduction in the inflammatory process uh, uh, found by the FIP score. 
A quick look again at, at some of our um, uh, anti, other anti-diabetic drugs. Uh, uh, one was the GLP-1 agonists, out of which uh, liraglutide and semaglutide has been undergoing uh, in the phase two trial. And specifically, the subcutaneous semaglutide is under, uh, under a good trial, uh, looking uh, at, at, at its impact on fatty liver disease. And uh, other than that, uh, uh, not much prospective uh, outcome has come out, uh, you know, from the trials of the, of the, with the DPP-4, that is citagliptine, and uh, empagliflozine compared to dapagliflozine in some studies, while I read, has, found, uh, has been found to be a little bit more effective in, in reducing the, uh, the overall hepatic uh, steatosis. Uh, and some of the other SGLT inhibitors have also been evaluated, but most of these are under registered clinical trials, and, and uh, the outcome of it are, are uh, yet to, for us to know. Uh, uh, but EMPA looks one of the most uh, promising, which might have an impact. Now, some of the other molecules which can, can have an impact on the lipid metabolism. They, those drugs are also under trial. Like, for example, uh, you can see Aramcol, that's an SCD inhibitor, and that is in the phase three and the phase two trial, and that is kind of uh, shown to improve hepatic steatosis, ALT levels, AST level, as well as HbA1c level. And uh, even the HMG coenzyme A reductase inhibitor like an atorvastatin had, has, is, is being uh, evaluated if it can have any impact, but there are no recommendations, uh, you know, uh, whether uh, a statin would at all have any benefit into the treatment. Uh, Going on further, we have got some uh, fibroblast growth factors and also some thyroid receptor beta agonists, which, uh, which is uh, resmitirom that is in phase three trial because there is a strong interlink has been found between uh, the thyroid receptors and, and the, uh, the molecular mechanism of uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And there is also a study showing that it shows improvement in the hepatic steatosis, liver fibrosis, and also improvement in the LDL level. So one was these drugs were predominantly targeting the, the hepatic steatosis, but then the other component of non-alcoholic fatty liver involves targeting the apoptosis and more importantly, the, the fibrosis. So you have the infliximab and uh, th 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 thalidomide. So these inflammatory cytokines stimulate hepatocyte apoptosis to the different pathways, like the trail signaling is there. And so TNF-alpha is a classical cytokine and its signaling pathway had been well investigated. So antagonists at different uh, you know, level of this can be a prospective uh, uh, pathway that can be blocked, uh, you know, which might have an impact into, into the treatment of NASH as well. Now, also in, uh, in, in NASH, we see that uh, there is a lot of inflammatory response happens in terms of the PAMP uh, uh, signaling or the lipopolysaccharide signaling. A uh, lot of pro-inflammatory signaling pathways are there through multiple receptors. So the drugs which regulate inflammation in, uh, in NASH by targeting different inflammatory pathways like TNF-alpha or interleukin-17 are uh, kind of uh, under evaluation if they can have any impact into the, into the treatment of uh, the fibrotic stage of the NASH. Uh, well, uh, again, the drugs which target the fibrosis, uh, 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 the fibrosis process. Now, the chronic hepatocytes injury induce the activation of the hepatic stellar cells. So again, certain drugs, uh, you know, these are all the blockers, you know, which acts through the uh, blocking of the cytokines have been, have been tried if they have an impact uh, in, uh, in the hepatic stellate cell deactivation. So that's, that's one way where the pathway can try to act. So an overview of the anti-apoptotic, inflammatory and fibrogenic agents which are under clinical trial and uh, uh, I have already discussed about most of them and there is a uh, there is a possibility of also combination therapy of pentoxifiline and metformin which can have a synergistic effect into the into the anti-apoptotic action 
There is also a role of stem cell therapy. I will just conclude with that. But before that, there are certain drugs like lactobacilli, which can have an impact on the gut microbiota. And this is known as the gut liver axis in, the, in patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver. So unhealthy diet, like high fat diet or a high sugary diet, induces these changes in the intestinal microbiome. And this in turn affects the alteration in the metabolites, such as a decrease in the, benefit, in the beneficial saturated fatty acid and an increase in the lipopolysaccharide level. And that leads to an impairment in the gut barrier. So if the gut microbiota can be changed with the help of lactobacillus. Now, lactobacillus is currently in the phase two trial, then there might be some, uh, some promising molecule uh, uh, result coming out of that. And finally, to end with stem cell therapy. So basically, mesenchymal stem cells isolated from different sources, uh, including the umbilical cord, bone marrow, placental adipose tissue, placental hair follicle, and function to improve liver fibrosis are being evaluated. And again, the impact of these mesenchymal stem cell therapy will be to reduce the eff effect of the uh, HCG, uh, HC, uh, HSC activation uh, in, in patients with extended liver fibrosis. These are some of the trials which were already undergo and then again they were also terminated because some of there was not significant outcome was, was uh, found out of them but search and research is still going on. So to conclude NFLD has become one of the leading cause of chronic liver disease and we must remember that it's not a single pathophysiology there is a spectrum of disease which surrounds individuals with NASH fibrosis and cirrhosis so we are looking at a multi-hit pathophysiology so diagnosis definitely involves uh, identification of hepatic steostrosis and followed by the risk stratification we must remember that weight reduction and reduction of the cardiovascular risk plays at the moment plays a very important role is the mainstay of treatment and we do have some exciting new therapies which could probably emerge which can transform the therapeutic options for patients in the next decade. Thank you.